Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the second part of our programme here on the Banco Sabadell stage at four years from now, Barcelona 2022. Now, that space where humans and technology meet, it's an increasingly rich and increasingly interesting space, but one that also has some, some concerns, some controversy around it. And what our next session here on the stage today, what our experts will hope to do is to dispel some of those myths, maybe to ease some of our concerns and share with it some of the benefits of around this, this coexistence of humanity and technology. So join me in welcoming to the stage our moderator for this session. Some say he's a man, some say he's a machine. I happen to think he's somewhere in between. Ladies and gentlemen, Asheen Lunny. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, David. Absolutely awesome. Much appreciated, amigo. Um, hola, bon dia, buenos dias. Great to see you all. Hello, hello. Great. Thank you. Come in, come in. Find yourselves a seat. We're going to have, as David very kindly mentioned, there, we're going to have an absolutely fascinating session right here, right now, which is all about the overlap between humans and technology. Uh, we're going to have a presentation and we're going to have a fireside chat and we're going to do a bit of a deep dive. We're going to bust through some myths and we're going to explore some incredibly exciting positive futures for humanity, for culture, for art, and how technology can bring this all together in a completely new way. We're at the beginning of a very exciting time of human history, and we're going to explore it right here. So, ladies and gents, we're going to start with the presentation, and our very special guest now is somebody who is an award-winning technology, innovation, and creativity executive, and he has been bringing art and artists, like incredible artists, deep into technology and deep into business for a very long time. And you're going to hear now about his unique view of the world. And there's some incredible takeaways there. And then we're going to be back on stage with another special guest. So uh, to talk about enhancing human creativity with technology, please give a very warm four years from now. Welcome to our very special guest, Dunal Heron from EY. Thank you. Hey, folks. Um, it's really great for me to be here with you to share a lot of the work we're doing, as Oshin said, bringing humanity, artists, the artistic perspective deep into business and deep into technology. And in particular focus, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we believe technology should be in service of humanity, in service of our humanity, and how we are going to bring that artistic perspective deep into our uh, business. And it looks like I've lost the slides already. Oh, here we go. So, um, there's a little bit of a, a dual philosophy between how technology is created today. A lot of people create technology today where they think it'll become more intelligent, more creative than humans. And that really is driving this notion that technology might supplant or supersede our humanity. We lose our jobs, and maybe there's nothing for humans to do anymore in this world. And uh, I and we at EY fundamentally disagree with that opinion. We actually uh, have a different philosophy in how we invest in technology, and that's that technology should be in service of our humanity. So when we develop technology, it's all about how we enhance or augment humans and our humanity. And I'm going to give you some examples about that type of work we're doing. So there's this complete, in my view, false narrative in the world today that there's a battle between humans on one end and machines and technology on the other. And in fact, in our view, and we have proof points to show this, that when you take the best of humanity, pair it with the best of technology, you can do so much more to the betterment of both. So what I'm going to talk a little bit about is share with you some of my views on what human intelligence is, what human creativity is, and compare and contrast that to machine intelligence and machine creativity. And then we'll go in and talk a little bit about uh, the metaverse and artificial intelligence as two examples. So, you know, there's a lot of hype uh, about how AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning will become more intelligent than humans. But I just want to let you know that if you think about it and you understand the technology really well, the terminology of intelligence in artificial intelligence actually doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I mean, there's, there's really fundamentally nothing intelligent about the algorithms today. They know nothing. They have no understanding. They have no comprehension. And therefore, how can you be creative if you don't have any of those attributes and those dimensions? They leverage computational power. They leverage memory recall. And the algorithms, as you know, only do very well what they are taught in a very limited window. Now, think about human intelligence. We obviously are not described like that. It's very different. 
And, and just to let you know, so you have a little bit of understanding as well, the models that we have for machine intelligence or artificial intelligence are based on a 70-year-old understanding of the human brain. And those mathematical models that have been developed at their, like at their base level from decades ago are based on that understanding that is very old. And through neuroscience and cognitive sciences, we've increased our level of understanding of the brain, human intelligence, creativity, way beyond that. But yet the mathematical models at their core are based on this fundamental understanding. So it's clear, I hope it's clear to you when you think about it this way, that the machine intelligence is not the same as human intelligence. And we should be very careful about how we state that they will supersede or become more intelligent than us. So here's a thought experiment uh, to give you a, a deeper sense of this. If you could remove the human brain from the body and keep it alive, but have it not coupled, connected to any part of the human body, what functionality would the human brain have? All right, just think about it just for a few seconds, right? The human brain, without being connected to the body, has no utility. It has no functionality. The human brain takes all of its value that it creates. It takes all of our sensory perception from our body, inside our body, outside our body, and the world around us. It takes in all those patterns, and then the brain makes sense of that. So if the brain is not connected to the body, does the concept of intelligence exist? What, what does our humanity mean if the brain is not connected to the body? And then also by extension, what does it mean uh, for machine intelligence, artificial intelligence? If algorithms don't have bodies, if algorithms don't sense the world around us, how can they be intelligent? So maybe they can do things really well that us humans can't do. But I would argue that machines and algorithms and machine intelligence will never become more intelligent or more creative than humans by definition because they don't have bodies, they don't sense the world, they don't have uh, sensing within their own bodies, outside their own bodies, and all of these kind of concepts are really important when you start fundamentally thinking about what is unique about humans versus what is unique about technology, algorithms, and machines. So another way for you to think about this is you, you realize from your own personal and professional interactions that we all have different personalities we all bring a lot of value to the world in different ways. We have different types of thinking, different types of intelligence. So there's about nine or so different types of human intelligence. There's about nine or so different types of ways of humans thinking. How many different ways of thinking and intelligence does a machine have? Again, none. If you follow my argument, if you believe in me, what I'm saying so far, you'll see that machines don't have any of this. So this is all unique to humans, unique to our humanity. We've evolved for hundreds of thousands of years psychologically, physiologically, biologically, every other ology you can imagine to have this level of capability. And the technology does not operate in this way whatsoever. So again, I'll, I'll restate my opinion on this. The technology can never, ever become more intelligent than humans because it doesn't have any of these attributes of our humanity. So I want to give an example. This is work I did um, a couple of years ago that we're continuing with an artist, a beatboxer. So a beatboxer is one of these people that can make their voice sound like a computer. Reeps One is his stage name. And, and Reeps One, a few years ago, felt that he had brought his voice to the absolute pinnacle of any human voice ever in the history. He didn't think he could push his voice any farther. And he started moving into other types of creative endeavors. And what we wanted to do with him was we wanted to dispel this myth about um, technology and machines being more intelligent and creative than humans. So we decided to train machine learning algorithms on his beatboxing. And after a period of time, what happened is the algorithms started sounding like him and started creating sounds and techniques that he had never performed in his life. So think about that. The human trained the algorithms, but then the algorithms gave him back sounds and techniques that he had never given it. And what we did is we turned this into a mechanism where he could real-time, live, collaborate what we were calling his second self or his AI digital beatboxing twin. And in the process of him being able to collaborate in real-time with this thing that was very similar to him, yet distinctly different, he's able to, in his own words, level, level up his voice. So he's creating new sounds and techniques that he never did before. He's composing and performing in entirely new ways. And he's opened up his voice to a whole new level of creativity, way beyond anything he thought was possible just a few years ago. Because we gave them this technological counterpart, which was not designed to replace him, or supplant him, or supersede him. But it was designed with the purpose of augmenting him 
and enhancing him as much as we possibly could. So that's a prime example. And I'd, I'd ask my friend at the back if we could just press play on that video and you'll see a little bit of it. And you can check out this work online if you um, Google search We Speak Music. <laughs> We've done a lot of follow-up work with him, trying to show him as a prime example. He was the best, one of the best that has ever lived in that field of beatboxing. No one had pushed their voice to that extreme as much as him. And then when we gave him this technological collaborator or counterpart, he was able to move his humanity, move his creativity to a whole new level. And this is the type of work that I get very excited about. And when we bring artists deep into business and into technology, is to give that very human-centric perspective. So just to wrap up this, this part, and I'll, I'll move on to the metaverse in a second. Machine intelligence and creativity, INC here for short, in my view is not the same as human intelligence and creativity. By the way, I described it in my view can never be the same. It's just fundamentally different always and always will be. And it's really good for us to know what are the benefits and attributes that humans bring and what are the different benefits and values and attributes that technology can bring separately and then how can we bring both of them together in really meaningful, compelling ways, always with humans at the center. So, so the metaverse, OK, I'm not going to explain my view on what the metaverse is in, in this part. I'm going to share that with a colleague of mine in a few minutes. But there's a lot of hype about the metaverse, right? There's a lot of buzz about it. And there's a lot of confusion around what the metaverse is. So I'd like to kind of take a similar way of thinking that I just shared with you around artificial intelligence and human creativity. And I'd like to kind of expand that a little bit around the metaverse. So in this physical world, we're all here in person for the first time in a few years. Uh, your body is interacting with the other people around you, even if you don't know each other here in the front row. Your body is interacting with the seat that you're sitting on, your feet on the floor. You can feel the air movement and the currents, and you can see the lights and everything. Your body, in all its senses, are always interacting with and within yourself and with and exterior to yourself and the world around. That is the core of our humanity. So what happens now when we move into the virtual, or we move into these hybrid physical and virtual environments? What happens to the human condition? What happens to our humanity? What happens to our intelligence? What happens to our creativity? When I could argue, and this is a little bit of an exaggeration, but in these virtual environments today, you lose four-fifths of your sensory perception. So what I mean by that is, in these environments, they're very much dominated on the visual. But what happens from a sound point of view? What happens from a touch, taste, smell? And then, by the way, there are about 27 human senses in total. People always talk about the five primary ones, but there's far more than them. What happens to all those other senses that make us uniquely human? So we lose a lot of that in these virtual environments. And the way people are talking about the metaverse today, and the way people are, are developing or building metaverse environments today, do not take this into account at all. They think that you as humans can be fooled that just by having some visual interface that will satisfy your humanity. And I would argue that you will not be fooled by that. I will argue that that will not be compelling for you. I argue that for us to connect our humanity to the technology with this purpose that I talk about, we need to deeply understand what is it about our humanity that is unique in the physical, and then how can we think about what might be missing in the virtual? Do we create entirely new human experiences do we even have a concept of maybe new human sensory perception in the metaverse? Or do we try and pretend that we just take the physical and we replicate it in the virtual? And as technologists, do we even care what harm that might do to humanity? So in the work I do, it's kind of informed deeply by thinking about these things at a fundamental level. What is fundamental about our humanity? What is fundamental about the technology, whether it's artificial intelligence or the metaverse? And where are the gaps? Where are the differences? And how might we create the technology with purpose to enhance our humanity? So I'll give you um, a prime example of work we're currently doing in this space. And this is the first time I've got to share this publicly. So it's quite exciting for me. We're working with an artist. Uh, Kate Mockteger is her name. And Kate identifies as being neurodivergent. She's on the autistic 
uh, spectrum disorder. And when she was younger, Kate had a hypersensitivity to a lot of uh, textures and a lot of aspects of the physical environment that those, those of us that are quote unquote neurotypical, we kind of, we ignore them. We're not sensitive to those environments at all. And so in Kate's lived experience in her life, she had to overcome this hypersensitivity. But that hypersensitivity and her ability to overcome it has made her hyper aware of a lot of things in the physical world, in the real world connected to our humanity that many of us just, we're completely, it's not obvious to us. We're kind of blind to it in some senses. We're ignorant to some of these experiences. And Kate creates these physical installations that are very touch sensitive, very interesting ways of working with colors and textures to help us kind of augment and highlight our creativity and how we interact with physical spaces. And with Kate, what we're doing is we're taking her lived experience, her insights, her neurodiversity, how she sees and interacts and thinks about the world in a very different way, and we're bringing that into what we're developing in the metaverse. And we're developing our virtual environments, our hybrid physical and virtual environments with artists coming deep in to inform us on our humanity, their lived experience, and how we can try and design these environments for everyone, maximum accessibility, so that everyone, no matter what part of life you come from, can interact and gain value and have access to these types of technologies, and always with humanity at our core. So this is, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna get into a sales kind of mechanism around the work we're doing at EY, but as you can tell, I'm passionate about bringing artists deep into technology and deep into business. This is work I've been doing for a number of years, and we're building out this activity at scale at EY. We're working with artists all over the world. And what's very important to us is that we can create the most cognitively diverse teams and the most cognitively diverse organizations by investing in what I would call massively interdisciplinary collaboration, investing in full spectrum diversity. And the particular work I do is about taking the vast differences between artists and creatives and how they see the world and interact with the world versus technologists and business people. And there is quite a big divide between those two worlds typically. And when we can overcome those barriers and bring them together, that's where I think absolute magic occurs. And that's where I believe the future of innovation resides at that interface of art and technology. Um, I'm not going to talk about this because I'd really want to make, give as much time to the panel as possible. You can take a picture of this if you like or follow up with me online and I'm happy to share more. But I've done a lot of work in what's the difference between uh, the artistic world, the creative world, and the technology and business world across all dimensions. And how can you go about overcoming those barriers, overcoming those tensions? How can you build common ground between these differences? And then how can you leverage that common ground to create value? So you know, I've implemented global scale initiatives to bring together these different perspectives and then show the value that can be created out of them. And I don't want to keep this knowledge to just ourselves or the company I work for. We really want to kind of share this way of working with people that are interested in it globally. So please reach out to me. I'm happy to share more. OK, so just in, in conclusion, very quickly, uh, and in case you didn't get this from my words and how animated I get, I truly, truly, truly believe that it's a complete and utter load of nonsense when people talk about uh, machine intelligence and artificial intelligence becoming more intelligent than humans. Because as I said, our intelligence is completely linked to the fact that we have bodies, and we have evolution, and we have lived experience. And our senses interact with the world around us and within us in very unique ways. And the algorithms and the technology have none of that, zero. Right? All, they, all the algorithms get are zeros and ones, zeros and ones. Now I'll ask you, do you live your life in zeros and ones? I would hope not. I'm getting a no uh, shake of the head here, thankfully. I was really worried there for a second. Um, you don't live your life that way. That is not what humanity is about. So if our intelligence is the summation and the integration of our lived experience, our evolution, culturally where we sit in the world, and how our body and our perception interact with the world and sense the world around us, and that's how we get intelligence in the brain when all that comes together, how could a machine possibly become more intelligent and more creative than a human? Now, machines and, and technology can do other things even better than us, but I would argue they will never be more than us in, in those two dimensions. And they're the dimensions that are most important in, in our humanity and how we can create value in this world. So I think I'd like to stop this false narrative that there's a battle between humanity and technology. Uh, there, there only is so if you don't really understand the fundamentals of it and if you choose to promote 
your work that way. I don't believe that that's the case. And a lot of the work I do is taking the best of technology with the best of humanity, bringing them together and see how we can do more than either on their own. And in particular, we bring artists deep into our business work, into our technology development, and we want to create a better working world by having humans at the center. So with that, I'd like to thank you for sitting in on the talk, listening to me uh, rant on uh, about humanity and technology. And I'd like to invite uh, our other panelists to have a broader discussion about humanity, technology, in the context of the metaverse as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Duna. That was amazing. My goodness, how mind-blowing. OK, um, so we are now going to welcome onto the stage a colleague of Dunal's from EY. Uh, she is a CMO practice leader. So uh, she's an accomplished media executive and marketing executive. She leads EY's CMO practice. And man, you should absolutely, you should link up with both of them on LinkedIn and check out their profiles because their resumes are awesome. And our next special guest has had a very long career in media and tech companies before EY, and uh, you will be impressed. So ladies and gents, please give a huge four years from now round of applause for our next guest, Janet Bayliss. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. You're, you're getting fox whistles. Fantastic, fist bumps <laughs> on stage, that's how we roll. Um, okay, so listen, welcome. That was just mind-blowing. We were both in the, the front row uh, yeah. doing all, just enjoying that so much. Uh, but you kind of opened the can of worms that is the metaverse. And so, you know, I thought we'd start with your good self, Janet. I wonder if you could share with the audience, how do you define the metaverse? How would you kind of sum it up for the folks here? Define the metaverse. Well, uh, so let's start with, of course, there are a lot of buzzwords out there. So we can start with the words, immersive, persistent, creative, virtual, and virtual meets physical. Um, and we can also talk about the notion of digital scarcity. Yeah. But beyond all the buzzwords, let's actually just break it down level by level. So if you think about it, there's hardware that mm. we need because the metaverse by definition is digital. And you're not digital, right? You're real. Just, okay. just about, yes. So, so <laughs> we need a way to participate in the digital world. So it's a gaming console. It's our desktop or laptop computer. It might be our television screen at some point that's going to get us into the metaverse. Um, it's going to be um, virtual reality. It is virtual reality headsets, of course, mobile devices. We have the, these hardware devices. We bring our identity. It's an avatar. It's uh, our identity. It's going to be our wallets. These are the things we bring into these worlds. It's virtual real estate. It's virtual worlds that are, by the way, not connected. There's no one metaverse. It's not some monolithic thing. Key point. Um, and it is not interoperable. Um, it is, uh, has some level of interoperability in the sense that it functions on the principles of the blockchain and on the, f on the principles of Web 3.0, um, which we'll ho hopefully talk about a little bit. But, um, but fundamentally, it is not an interoperable one single uh, metaverse. And then of course we can do all the things uh, that we would like to do, uh, subject to the sensory issues that Donald was talking about earlier. Yeah. We can work, live, play, act, buy, buy virtual goods, buy physical things. So that's probably the easiest way just to work our way through the metaverse. Nice, I like it. And a bit of real talk there, you know, because we, we do live in this world of hype and we're all somewhere on the hype cycle, maybe at the beginning for this thing we call sure. the metaverse. It isn't a, an amazing, magical, parallel, digital world that we can just step into and fly around and all the rest. You know, Dunal, what's your, your take? Would you, would you elaborate on that? Yeah, and again, sure. with the focus on what we actually have. Yeah, okay, maybe because we're all real people, can we do a show of hands? Anyone confused about the difference between Web 3.0 and the metaverse? Anyone? <laughs> no, you all understand it perfectly. I only saw one hand in the back. Wow, we've a, such an educated audience. Um, it's, it's a, there's a lot of confusion, you know, is the metaverse part of Web 3.0? Is 3.0, Web 3.0 part of the metaverse? And uh, we talk about this a lot. Um, I think that there's two different ways of looking at it, or one good way of looking at it. You have Web 3.0, which is all about decentralization built on the blockchain. And then you have the metaverse, which is all about how the physical and the virtual come together more in a 3D sense. Yep. So think about the internet today. It's very 2D, it's very linear, it's very text-based. Like you go to your website, you scroll down through all the text, everything is 2D. But in the future, the metaverse part of the internet will be fully immersive, 3D, explorable. Again, much more like the physical world. You don't interact with the world today in 2D, right? I hope at least. You interact with the physical world in 3D and the metaverse will be that three-dimensionalization of the web but a lot of that will be built on Web 3.0 principles. 
blockchain as an enabling technology that allows the world to start operating in this sense of what's called decentralization, which is really potentially a fundamental shift to not just how we look at cryptocurrency and finance, but I'll give you a very silly example in a way. Like the company you work for today might not have a CEO, might not have a board of directors, might not have an executive committee. You as the employees, if your company went into full decentralized mode, all of you would collectively make the decisions for the company. Mm -hmm. So when you think about profound shifts in business and humanity, this concept of decentralization could change sure. everything. Fascinating, I mean, that reminds me a bit of the, the e-democracy experiments that I uh, saw over in Sweden a little while ago. Um, but coming back to yourself, Janet, now we've been hearing there from Dunal, uh, you know, some real talk again about what the metaverse is and isn't, but you know, what are some of the ways that it can actually enhance our, you know, our lives in the physical world? You know, how can it incrementally make our lives better in, you know, as consumers, as folks in the world of business? You know, what are some of the, the case studies you would like to see or you're seeing already? Sure, well I, I think the first thing we have to acknowledge is it's really early days. Sure, sure. So the, the fact is that because it's not monolithic and because these worlds are still emerging, there's no easy way to move from one world to the next. So the first thing is to, is to recognize that there are use cases that are extremely interesting and very creative. Um, many of them exist, for example, in the luxury retail goods area. You're seeing a lot of um, wonderful experiences around NFTs and you're seeing um, people start to experiment with the notion of, uh, of virtual retail and virtual goods. And I think we're going to see a lot of experimentation, a lot of those things are going to be very early days though because fundamentally, if you don't have scale, it's very hard to build a business model. So we have to think about the horizons for this. I think if we look right now at where we're going to see scale, it might be things like employee experience because we can actually traverse geographies, we can create community, we can create experiences that we cr can't create in the virtual world. Think about it, we're all here in the, this uh, wonderful physical environment, it's nice to be in the real world, by the way. Um, but when we think about uh, what the metaverse can create, can we recruit in the metaverse? Can we create an entire opportunity for reward and recognition of employees to bring communities of people in larger scales, uh, larger scale c companies, which immediately can bring scale to a metaverse experience. So I think those will be uh, some of the interesting opportunities. And of course, by definition, it brings a whole new creative palette. And I think what Donald was saying about senses is so important. Um, if we think about it, the humanity of our senses really is critically important, and we're only at the beginning of opening up all of those different elements of the creative palette. We have to bring together IOT with sensors so that we can relate the physical to the, to the virtual world. What we don't want to do is lift and shift and just create a digital replica of the things that we see in the physical world and make it less enchanting, less entertaining, less emotionally connected. So things like haptic technology, things like uh, all of these things coming together, it's the convergence of all of that and really making it feel intuitive that will bring that next generation experience to life. Yes, yeah, spot on, because you know, as we're talking about here, there's different devices, different metaverses, there are walled gardens. Uh, it doesn't actually, you know, to pick up on the, your, your final point there, it doesn't feel that intuitive. No. You know, how do we go about making the metaverse intuitive and kind of opening it up to people? I, I think we have to remember there's sort of two key principles. Scale is what we're going, what we want to move towards. Yeah. And certainly on the internet, it is a network, right? So it, you always are benefited when you can connect the network. In the early days, it was the scale of data, the social graph, that's what unlocked the power of whether it was search or the social media or any of the things that we derive joy from um, in the internet as we know it today. So we're going to want to seek scale with all of that. By the way, in light of decentralization. So there's going to be these competing forces. At the same time, to make it intuitive, we have to overcome friction. Mm -hmm. So friction in the experience is our enemy. Friction between the worlds, friction between understanding how to navigate them. If you've talked to anyone who has tried to navigate the metaverse today, it is fraught with fi friction. And so we are you know, in the pre-early adopters. When somebody has gone to, um, you know, deal with cryptocurrencies and all of these things, these are people who are willing to learn, willing to experiment, willing to go through um, what are often very fruitful experiences, but are often very complex experiences. When that friction comes out of it, that's when I think we unlock the next level of what this can and should be.
Yeah, agreed, absolutely. I mean, a, a million years ago, back at, you know, like 2011, I think it was, I used to work in the metaverse as it was. There was this virtual hotel space called Habbo Hotel. Yeah. And we sold more pieces of furniture than Ikea. I was a country manager and our business cards were our <laughs> avatars. And obviously they were, they kind of looked a bit like us in real life. But, you know, today in 2022, how do you think that people's identities in the real, you know, the physical world relate to their identities in the metaverse? Who wants to jump in there? Yeah, I mean, very quickly, I think it's hopefully up to each of us. Yeah. I mean, do you replicate this identity completely in the virtual? Or do you choose to go completely fantastical and I represent myself as something totally, maybe not even human? Mm. You know, so I, I would hope it's completely up to you. How you want to identify, uh, how you identify, by the way, not always persistently, but maybe in different environments, different scenarios to different groups. Yeah. Maybe when I'm in my EY uh, environment, I'm pretending to be super professional and <laughs> my avatar has cleanly Wait, shaved. Wait, you've been pretending? I've been pretending, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. But maybe when I'm interacting with my artistic colleagues, I'm uh, choosing to express myself in a very different way, which yeah. might be better suited for that community for me to engage with them. So I would hope it's up to everyone and it's on a, on a massive spectrum. And on each hourly basis, you might choose to uh, share your identity in various different ways. Yeah. I, I think it's it's another form of self-expression. Yeah. And I think that again, the interoperability issues right now are going to, it's early days of people having the opportunity to choose their avatar in a game environment versus how they're going to express themselves in other places in the metaverse. But ultimately, this will become not only how we express ourselves visually and other elements of it, how our voice shows up in those environments, whether we're, uh, you know, whether we look different, whether we look better, uh, are more athletic, less athletic, whatever it may be, um, uh, and, and we bring that to, to these worlds. But to me, it's the question of how you bring it through the worlds that becomes uh, the problem that will be really important to solve. And a lot of that will come with these issues of currency and our wallet and our financial uh, persona that not only is our personality, but the, the business and our commercial sensibility that we bring with us. Oh yeah, for sure, you know, and, and exactly like you're saying, as, as we express ourselves wearing a, a rock and roll t-shirt or a suit or a clean shaven, we have a beard or whatever, you know, th that totally kind of evolves into another dimension yeah. in the metaverse. But what do you think this means, this kind of fluidity of identity? What does it mean for inclusivity? You know, so like both for people going in and then how they behave and, and how they can kind of take advantage of the metaverse once they're in there. Who'd like to jump in? I mean, I hope it means more inclusivity, and yeah. I hope it means more accessibility from a socioeconomic standpoint, from a geographic standpoint. I hope it brings more people together, and I think there are a lot of reasons to believe that the metaverse has that promise. Um, and even if we uh, deal with the, the fictional uh, story of you know, Ready Player One, you know, I think there is a story of uh, accessibility of the metaverse, bringing in somebody from a socioeconomic story where they, they were disadvantaged and they come into, come into the metaverse. But I, I do think we have to watch out for the digital divide. And I think we have to think about is the metaverse and is this technology truly accessible to all? And again, going to the fictional story, um, you know, were certain things only accessible to people who had more financial means? And so I think there are pros and cons that we're going to have to be very mindful for as the stewards of this future, as technology leaders, as innovation leaders, we have to be very careful how we take on this new power. Yeah, well said, absolutely, Tuna. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot about trolling Oh, yeah. in the internet yeah. today. So even if you do express yourself totally different in the metaverse through whatever way you want to do it, there's still going to be some other human being out there that wants to troll you. What I'm very interested in is how, how we might think about removing some of that. And this is again where I think decentralization comes in because there are some kind of platforms today like Discord where you're on a certain channel. It's the community that decides what's acceptable. And if you break those community rules, there's a mod, a moderator, that will give you a warning and say, Ushin, you know, you shouldn't have said that, that's breaking the rules, but one more time that you do it, you're out. Yeah. Um, so I think, the, again, the de decentralization part of Web 3.0, how it might manifest in the metaverse through social networks and things like that, I think that becomes very interesting where we, the community, have the power, yeah. and you can decide to be in a group where trolling is acceptable, because that is going to happen. We can't remove that, it's an unfortunate part of humanity, but you can also choose to be in a group where that is completely not acceptable and you're with your tribe that want to communicate in a nice way with each other and bolster each other and help each other and be more creative. So I think again, there's going to be all this 
um, all these factions of like a trolling type community yeah. where everyone wants to be abusive and okay, go for it if you're happy with that. But then there's a more like, let's do good for society, let's help each other out, community that will evolve. And, and I think again with the metaverse, if we think about it the right way today, we have the opportunity to to give shape and give scope for all of that, right? Yeah, absolutely. That, that nice one, that second option says that my kind of tribe, I prefer I that one, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and coming over to yourself, Janet, we heard about you know, the, the whole concept of decentralization, which is by its nature, it's empowering people, it's really decentralizing uh, control of these spaces. You know, what's your take on this? Do you think it can be a net positive for humanity? Where, where do you think the metaverse might take us? So, I think there are a couple of concepts that are emerging with this that underpin it. Um, the first is the notion of disintermediation, yeah. right? So if we achieve this, we are going to take out a lot of middle men, women, people uh, yes. along yes. the way here. Um, uh, we'll give the gender neutral version. Um, but you know, there's no question that we are facing an opportunity to um, have, for example, transactions travel with the trust inherent in the transaction, to have um, uh, no need for uh, lots of other parties that today sit everywhere in the value chain and don't need to any longer. So I think that's a really exciting opportunity that I think is very empowering. It is unlocking, going back to the theme of creativity, the creator economy in so many different ways. I think the other notion that is um, emerging from all of this is the notion of self-monetization, mm. which is also comes with this idea of removing um, the intermediaries. In the current world, so many of us access content, services, all sorts of different things because we give our data and our attention to other companies um, in exchange for the access to those opportunities. Mm. And I think the question becomes, in a world where we can transact directly, what does that mean for self-monetization? What does that mean for our ability to, uh, to uh, build a business model around ourselves? Now the question that will uh, become, I think the most important one of all, is what happens in this world to create scale? Because as soon as everything becomes decentralized, you end up with, an, uh, with a lack of connectivity. So blockchain does create connectivity, and that is what is tethering it all together in this future state in Web 3.0. But the question becomes, where will the points of scale come from? You know, if you go to the very early days of, of technology, it was in hardware, it was in software, it's been in data, it's been in, uh, it's been in a host of different moments in the social graph. Now we have to figure out where will it come, uh, will it be in the, uh, in the wallets that we carry? Will, uh, you know, if, for example, as we transact in cryptocurrency, will it be in, uh, in our avatars, in our identities that we carry in these decentralized environments? Because the value will be created in the scale and so that's going to be an interesting thing for us to contemplate. Oh, for sure, absolutely. Watch this virtual space, as they say. And, and yes. Daniel, coming over to yourself, you mentioned the importance of uh, different kinds of diversity earlier. And uh, it reminded me of a presentation I saw by the former chief innovation officer over at Disney, a guy called Dunkel Mordel. And he basically boiled it down to uh, diversity is innovation. Without this kind of 360 diversity of viewpoints, you, you don't really get to unlock yeah. innovation. You know, what role do you think we should be putting on the importance of diversity with this whole new uh, virtual and metaverse world that's opening up now? Yeah, I mean, an example I give a lot is, um, I talk to some folks about you know, diversity and cognitive diversity, and they say, oh, we're very diverse. And I say, okay, give me an example. And what they do is they point like, oh, See those five white guys over there? <laughs> yeah, like one went to Stanford, went, one went to Berkeley, no. one, one spent a year traveling Europe, and then they say, look, we're, we're diverse, we're cognitively diverse, look, look at, That's but it's still like five white guys, relatively same cultural background, educated in the same way. Mm -hmm. I'd say, well, okay, you've kind of scratched the surface of diversity and cognitive diversity, but you're only representing a sliver of humanity, so there's so much more. Um, and those five people, no matter how educated they are, no matter how many years they spent traveling in Spain or France or wherever else, or what university they went to, they cannot possibly represent the breadth of humanity. They can't possibly know the cultural differences between Spain, within Spain, Spain and France. I'm from Ireland, I live in America. Talk about cultural differences, although there's big overlap as well. Yeah. So these are the things that need to get represented in the technology and the products in our business, the fact that Human, there's diversity across humanity, and if you're building products by just a select few people, white guys from tech typically, then you're only representing and only building for a sliver of humanity. And this is a, a, a model we need, really need to break out of in the in modern world. 
Oh, absolutely. I think if we don't kind of hardwire diversity into this new metaverse experience, we are lining ourselves up for a heap of trouble. You know, it's uh, without diversity, there's no innovation, there's no breadth of experience. And, uh, you know, so it sounds, you know, just to wrap up, it sounds like the metaverse is an amazing place. It's got so much potential. It's going to help us in business, in our everyday lives. It's going to revolutionize how we can connect, express ourselves, and collaborate all over the world. But we have to get everyone on board. We have to make the on ramps diverse, easy, open, and uh, these are very exciting times. So, ladies and gents, please join me in thanking our amazing speakers, Dunal Heron and Janet Bayliss. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.